the big why to me is really about your audience. Why is your audience interested in this? Companies tend to believe that they're in charge in a relationship, but the truth is employees are people. Positioning is poetry. Think of it that way and happiness ensues. From Orion X, this is The Marketing Podcast. Marketing as a function has transformed in significant ways. More technology, more data, more social, more blending of arts and sciences, more integrated with every other function, and ultimately more critical to the organization. Join Shaheen Khan and Doug Garnett as they discuss news and happenings in the world of marketing, from the boardroom to customer programs. Hey, everybody. This is Shaheen Khan and Doug Garnett again. And all things marketing. Doug, how are you? Good, Shaheen. Happy February. Happy February. That's right. We had you had almost a palindrome day the other day. I know. I loved it. O two o two twenty twenty two. Mm. You got it. Beautiful yeah, day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Almost, almost perfect. So, first topic is poetry in marketing. A topic that came up on Twitter this past week, and it was a delight for me to see. And part of it is because I think poetry has a lot to do with marketing. It does. Poetry is brilliant for encapsulating stuff that's very hard to speak about. A poet is, at least the ones I like, goes deep in looking at things and situations and ideas to point out what we all tend to miss in our busy lives and as we go through it. Of course, that always makes us a little bit fearful of poets because they might say something that makes us uncomfortable. But there's some brilliant stuff, and I love it particularly uh, when they turn to business and talk about those realities. So for a long time, I've thought that poetry is highly relevant to marketing, exactly for the reasons you mentioned. I like to formulate it in terms of synthesis rather than mm-hmm. analysis, which I think a lot of marketing is all about, and how you can synthesize a lot of meaning into few words that just hits the mark. Mm-hmm. And I think that's just the essence of positioning and branding and I love it when I see it. And it was nice to see that that thread. Well, I think also poets are brilliant at the connections that we would otherwise all miss. You know, I mean, I'm a particular fan of uh, T.S. Eliot, and he'll connect some of the odd things. And yet you see these consistencies across. And in marketing, that's really important. You know, we, it, right. we do well when we are able to see those things or have somebody else see it for us. My uh, walk away is... Positioning is poetry. Think of it that way and happiness ensues. And if nothing else, reading poetry is good training for us marketers. Discipline for our minds, I think. Yes. So next topic was what I'm sensing, at least personal experience, as emerging, and that's recruitment marketing. What I have seen traditionally is that you have a company and you can market that to investors. You have product and you market that to customers or offering and you market. And then you have a lot of different things that you market to recruits. And that's the job itself, the compensation, the benefits, but also things like what is the impact that I'm going to have on society? You know, that all dovetails with brand purpose and culture and things like that, the softer parts of the company that are very important for a recruit. And then you need to market all of the above to existing employees because they're going to want to monitor this all the time. And I'm just seeing the importance of recruitment marketing and employee marketing increasing in the recent past. Yeah, I agree. I think it's, you know, the great resignation is reminding us that, I mean, whatever it is, we don't know all the details, but nonetheless, it reminds us that I think companies tend to believe that they're in charge in the relationship. Um, But the truth is employees are people and they need to see reasons that are very human for why they're in a company. They need to see respect that is very human. I have particular things that I just really dislike, which is a lot of the frontline retail help is treated very, very badly. The way that reviews come back, they're punished for any review that's less than a nine. Silly things oh, wow. that are yeah. uh, really inhuman, but standard operating procedure in a lot of companies. So I think if we can walk away with that, that's kind of nice from there, but yeah. You know, a common thread in our conversation really is how all of this stuff is done badly mm-hmm. and how that's in fact part of the problem. And it is so prevalent that You can't just filter it out and put it in the corner and say, well, that's just, you know, the guys who do it badly. And there's so many, it happens with such frequency Mm -hmm. that you can't Mm -hmm. help but have to talk about it and cover it. So that's unfortunate. True. The retail problem, I, I think, starts with there are standards for customer service that demand MBS uh, statistics 
and net promoter scores. And that whole has created this amalgam where I'm sure that the managers in the uh, companies who put them in place think they're doing the smart thing because that's just the way you're supposed to do it. And they've got the stand. ISO is over here saying you should do this. But the net out is a human mess at the store and really very unfair for these people. So I think the result is obviously, like you mentioned, the great resignation that people mm -hmm. want more. They demand more from their jobs. The second thing is employee activism. I see some of that. And I think both of those are reactions to how things have not been getting done right and how they must or bad things happen. I agree with that. I think that we, we are suffering at least somewhat from impacts from shareholder value, where boards and CEOs and executives are so focused on shareholders that employees get the short end of the stick, despite the fact that they put 40 hours of their life every week, week after week, or even longer hours into the job. Not that they're rocket scientists, all of them, but it doesn't matter. There are people who are dedicating and should be simply respected for that. Yeah, you know, unfortunately, I was joking about frequent flyer miles that, you know, the airline now knows exactly how badly they can treat you and get away with it. <laughs> and I think there is there is definitely an angle there with like how you treat mm -hmm. everybody. And, and when right. you push it too hard, you get these reactions and that's mm -hmm. just poor risk management and poor business practices. Well, it is. It, it also fits in with what I'm kind of calling a certain kind of decay that we see. You know, I love the cartoons that come out with the people in the 1950s eating on an airplane and saying, oh, my God, just imagine how great the food will be in, in the, the year 2000. <laughs> yeah, um, about that. We've seen decay in, you know, there's no longer anybody you can talk to about your subscription. There's no longer anybody, as we've automated all these things, and it's not that they're wrong to do, but it does leave a bit of a feeling of what happened. Okay, so two topics came up here that we should talk about. One is brand purpose, and then the other one is automating things and the complexity of handling some things that on the face of it look really simple. Let's do brand purpose because you shared this article about how brand purpose lead you astray. And I had some different thoughts about it. So let's talk about that. Well, yeah, the, what I see in how it can lead us astray is that there are too many people or companies who are interpreting brand purpose as an abstract. So they tend to go out entirely separate from their company life and identify some abstract idea of doing good in the world. And they call that their brand purpose. But to my mind, what we do fits in a business and in an industry and in creating a product, we're creating a product for customers or we're creating a service for customers. And, you know, our purpose should be wrapped around that. I do think we have a little crisis that a lot of companies have forgotten what they're really about. I mean, I think, you know, brands have become kind of trading cards. You know, I'll trade you two dial soaps and a, uh, and a Gillette razor for whatever. And that kind of disconnects. And it, it goes with the business school trend of the idea that somebody out of business school is supposed to be able to manage any business and be a high success in it. And we know that doesn't work, but that's the theory they're taught, which is you're learning all these skills that are independent of where you apply them, but it's all about where you apply them. Right. So, you know, where I had a differing thought with the article you shared was that I think starting with why is a very legit thing to do mm -hmm. as long as the question is formulated right. And the big why to me is really about your audience. Why is your audience interested in this? That's why you're doing it. You're doing it because your audience, somehow you think your audience is interested in this. So understanding why, that's the why to ask. And if your audience is interested in your brand purpose, well then by God, you better cover it in a very legit way. And it right. better be real and it better be factual and it better not be misleading all of the above, right? But I also agree that it is the how that is your differentiation because the why can be easily replicated. You say, I do it for this purpose. The next guy comes in and says, I do it for the same purpose. So the difference between the two is how you approach it. I fully agree with that. I think that, you know, I think that's what, you know, when we isolate brand purpose as if it's a separated thing that you just pick one, you know, here, here's 10, which one do you want to be? We do it wrong. If we take brand purpose as integral to what we make, why we make it, who we sell it to, who our investors are, all of those things come together, then it really rocks. I mean, we need purposes. And I do think that part of the reason that brand purpose is around right now is that companies have become bad at it and had kind of believed that making money is all it is. Just by making some money, that's all that matters. And it's not, not certainly not, and not to employees. Well, in fact, as you just said, where I've seen brand purpose get criticized is when 
it's done in advertising. Mm -hmm. And I'm saying that, okay, well, what was your advertising targeting? If it was targeting the investor community who said we really are really hot about ESG, environmental, you know, sustainability governance or diversity or inclusion or whatnot, well, then by God, do that. But if you're targeting consumers, well, is it important to them? If it is, more power to you. If it isn't, well, then why are you doing that, right? And then related to this is really advertising as opposed to marketing. Because as you know, one of my rants has been that advertising, especially, and then PR to some extent, sometimes don't see themselves as part of marketing. They don't see themselves under the umbrella of marketing. They see themselves as parallel and separate from marketing. And they even refer to each other like that, you know, like marketing said so. Well, you are marketing, right? It's not like, (laughs) so I think that's also part of it is that if you consider all of marketing, then you can really have these conversation in a more holistic way. I agree with that. Absolutely. And I agree with you. There are companies that do this very well. I mean, most of the companies I know that survive and thrive have a focus on what it is that they do. And then they may also do some good things for the world. In addition, I often advise do the good things, but don't really worry about telling people much about them. They're really not part of your market. They should just be good things you do. Right. It's hard enough to just sell a product and do that morally, effectively, well, responsibly, with purpose. Exactly. So to me, it's as simple as asking the right why. Why is your audience interested in this? Focusing on how, because that's your differentiation, and then focusing on what, and that what needs to be real, tangible, evidence-backed, blah, 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 right? Mm Mm-hmm. I'm with you. So the other topic that came up was really the complexity of delivering some of these things that look simple. In fact, package delivery was one thing that we talked in pre-show, just the nature of the product and how complicated things are when you dial into it. And of course, you teach a class in marketing. So tell us a little bit about how you handle it in in the classroom environment. That was really interesting. And your perspective on all of this. Well, and I mentioned earlier, you know, when I teach, the challenge you have in business school is there's this idea that business school, we're teaching them abstract skills that can be applied in any area, any company. And that that's the best way to be successful. Well, we also know that isn't exactly true. So what we're teaching and what I look at is we're teaching them abstract skills that then they have to apply in businesses. So in each one of my classes, I assign a category of consumer good for the class to deal with for the entire quarter. Unfortunately, it's only a quarter, it's 11 weeks. But, you know, mostly with case studies, I see students dig into it for two or three weeks and not more than that. So by the end of the quarter, you know, I picked funky categories because they are tremendously interesting and sophisticated. So one of my classes is dealing with house paint this term. And I've done this a number of times. And by the time they get to the end of the quarter, what I hear back from students is, oh my God, I had no idea that house paint was such a, all these things, all these flavors and manufacturing and approaches and understanding the customer. So I use that category focus because how can you consider business separate from a category? You really can't. It's not an abstract thing. It's something we have to do with respect to whatever we deliver. I think that's brilliant. I really, really like this. In fact, I remember my advice to my staff in the old days was, In marketing, you have to know two things really well. You have to know the customer, and everybody knows that, and everybody focuses on that. But what you need to focus to is know the product. And that's really where a lot of that complexity comes in that is not transferable, Mm -hmm. because now you need to know the nuances of the business you're in, not just sort of the amorphous it can be applied because I just know the mathematics of it. Yeah, you mentioned advertising. I know I, I had one client at a large company say that nothing uh, made him more angry than going to New York where a 24-year-old creative director would tell him how to run his billion-dollar business. I mean, it's just, it's absurd some days the kinds of things you see coming out of, you know, you encounter in business where you just shake your head. <laughs> That's right. All right. Finally, we had some news from the FTC and having to throw their muscles, throw their weight around in how people manage comments, right? Yeah. The FTC has cracked down on a set of companies for for deleting all their negative reviews. And they were using an outside vendor to do it. So this outside vendor managed reviews and then any that were negative got deleted. I'm actually very glad the FTC stepped in. So I'm like amazed that people would do that because this sounds to me like dishonest. If it isn't illegal, it's because it's too obvious 
to make it illegal. But, you know, why are people, what are they thinking? Number one, number two, you know, mm -hmm. those negative comments can in fact be very good. I don't know what to say about what are they thinking. I do fear sometimes that we have allowed the idea that if the free market accepts it, it must be moral. You know, <laughs> if I can get away with it, it must be moral. Probably no different now than any time in history, but there is always a section of humanity who believes that. If I can get away with it, it must be right. And we know that's not true. As to you know the downside, I think that's what the companies miss. And I talk to people, they tend to look for the negative reviews, not as a way of using them to deny buying the product, but to learn more about the product. Because if I exactly. go look at a review and somebody says, well, you know, I like my Ford Explorer, except I couldn't drive over Mount Whitney in California in it. And therefore, I was very disappointed. I say, I don't have any interest in driving over that kind of off-road in my Ford Explorer. So, okay, now I understand they didn't like that, but I'm probably going to love it. Exactly. I do it all the time. And I see some yeah. negative comment and I say, okay, got it, but that's not my use case. It yeah. doesn't impact mm -hmm. me. And I'm grateful that I know about it and mm -hmm. I can avoid it, but I'm still going to go ahead and buy the product. I mean, at the end of the day, I think a purpose of marketing is to map your real capabilities to like genuine needs. So if my genuine needs are met, I'm good. In all the selling that I did, you and I did together, you know, way back, I kind of came out with a sense that if someone gets the product and they're happy with it, then you've done a good job selling. Because yeah. if selling is tough, you can't explain everything. You can't tell them all the negatives. You, I mean, there's all sorts of things. I mean, some say, well, you got to be bluntly honest about everything the product can or can't do. How do you do that? Because there's so, you know, it's too open-ended and it's not going to sell. Question is, are people going to be fundamentally happy when they get your product? And negative reviews sort out the people who shouldn't buy your product. Right. 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 Because really, you do not want to be selling your product to people who are wrong for it, or else you're going to be in, uh, get in, in big trouble. And I've seen a number of tool brands that have stagnated because they pushed hard and got into a lot of garages. And then you find out through research that people haven't even opened the box. No, I think you're right. It's a big customer satisfaction thing. All right. So customer satisfaction, not a bad note to end this episode. Nope, not at all. Uh, thanks. Thank you, everybody, for listening. Until next time. Take care. Thanks, Shaheen. That's it for this episode of The Marketing Podcast. Every episode is posted on orionx.net and shared on social media. Use the comments section or tweet us with any questions or to propose topics. If you like the show, rate and review it on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen. The Marketing Podcast is a production of Orion X. Thank you for listening.